Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining. Today, we're talking about Aspire Apartments in San Antonio. Uh, this is, of course, Rob Beardsley, the founder of Lone Star Capital, joined by Craig McGrother, our director of business development. We are both very excited to present Aspire here. This is actually our first deal in San Antonio. So as many of you know, we are a Texas-focused multifamily firm with now over $500 million in acquisitions, and that's all in Texas. Heavily focused on Dallas and Houston, uh, but specifically Houston, and more recently, we've entered into the Dallas market and now San Antonio market as well. And there are actually some very good reasons for those expansions, which we will cover in today's presentation. Before we get into the specifics of the deal, we'll cover a little bit more about Lone Star Capital itself. So as I mentioned, I'm one of the founders. Kent Petrakovsky and I are the founders of Lone Star Capital. We started Lone Star back in 2018 to focus on Texas workforce housing. Uh, we are here based in New York City. Uh, I'm here currently in the One World Trade Center office. And we operate in New York, but own exclusively in Texas. And we also, in 2021, launched our in-house property management platform called Radiance Living, which Kent is the CEO of. So Kent is uh, always getting his hands dirty in the day-to-day -day management of the portfolio. Um, of course, working very closely with our asset management team uh, directed by Josh Hoffman. And then to, to your right, you also see Craig, who is our director of business development. As I mentioned, he's here on the call with us today as well. To round out the investor relations team, we have my sister, Dasha Beardsley. So I'm sure many of you have interacted with her. Uh, we strive to provide best-in-class investor relations. So we work really hard to answer emails promptly and really just provide the best service we can uh, to ensure uh, peace of mind and, and our investors' ability to sleep well at night. So we'll jump ahead a little bit. As I mentioned, Radiance Living is our in-house management platform. You know, what we do day in and day out would not be possible without the people at Radiance, uh, which is led by Aaron Petrie, our executive vice president uh, down in Houston. So the management team, Radiance, is based in Houston. We're actually planning in 2024 to open an office in Houston uh, for the Radiance team. So that'll be exciting for them. And it'll definitely be cool to go down and kind of see everybody in one place as that team continues to grow. Uh, specifically, just a shout out, we hired uh, an accountant late last year. And so starting January 1st, uh, just a couple of days ago, we are now performing accounting in-house, which is going to really help with producing our financial statements on time uh, and, and more efficiently, which will help us get our reports out on time and earlier, as well as our distributions, which we know is super important uh, for all that to be moving like a well-oiled machine. Yeah, no gonna, delayed K1s out here. Yeah, no delayed K1s, no delayed distributions. That's what we strive for. So I'm going to skip uh, through testimonials, case studies, tracker, and everything like that. Happy to deep dive on us uh, if, if someone wants to do that. Uh, but let's focus on Aspire and be economical with our time here. So, so Aspire Apartments, 335 units built in 1986 in the strong submarket of Inspiration Hills, Balcones Heights, uh, which is the northwestern portion of San Antonio. And San Antonio, you know, of course, all markets have their nuances, but San Antonio is kind of a simpler market. You know, basically everything north is better than south. So you want to be kind of north and then working your way out west. And even some parts of east are good as well. Uh, and, you know, there's different pockets that might appeal to different types of investors, but we definitely really like this particular pocket because we're right near the med center, which is a huge employment driver in San Antonio as a whole. And then we're also close to downtown, uh, but we don't battle new supply. The way that San Antonio works is all the older workforce product is actually kind of tightly bunched in and the more outer rings of the city are newer and newer. And that's where the development is focused. So funny enough, we prefer to be kind of not, not downtown, but kind of in the inner loop of the city where the product is older and it caters towards uh, really quality, stable workforce housing, which San Antonio has a ton of, which is one of the reasons why we were so desirous of entering into the San Antonio market. The other reason, which is really important for this deal, why we were very excited to be entering the San Antonio market is the opportunity to partner um, with nonprofits to provide affordable housing and to 
receive property tax exemptions. So as many of you know, we've been very successful throughout our portfolio and with um, acquisitions to create affordability and to actually get property tax exemptions on our properties. And this property, we're also pursuing a strategy which we are going to be getting a 50% property tax exemption on this deal, which really makes the numbers sing while taking very little risk because the risk of the tax exemption is really all done prior to closing. So on the day of closing, we'll have that partial tax exemption fully in place. And so the value add plan, if you will, of raising NOI via the tax exemption is all baked day one, which means investors take no risk in that matter. Yeah. And to further bake the point of, you know, this deal being just perfect for Lone Star Capital, we currently have nine deals with, you know, similar abatement structures and programs. This will be the 10th. So of 17 deals in a portfolio, this will be the 18th of which more than half will be in some sort of tax abatement program. So this is directly in line with what our in-house management team uh, is used to handling and just falls in line with us getting, you know, alpha returns uh, for our incredible partners and investors. Yep. Very good point. Yes. Our team is well-suited and has the experience of handling the certifications and kind of the complexities associated with these tax exemptions, as well as the on the ground day-to-day -day management of dealing with uh, affordable tenants where they have to certify their income and we have to restrict rents and things like that. All the nitty gritty that we have uh, a ton of experience with. So to take a step back, we first began tracking this deal in July of 2023. And as we all know, the market has just been uh, very volatile and has been in a constant state of flux. And so uh, the, the seller had a higher price target originally, uh, and we were unwilling to meet that price expectation. But as the market changed and as the circumstances uh, for the seller changed, uh, we were able to actually get a price discount and meet the seller in the middle for a price that made sense for us. And that was in part due to the fact that the seller is in a, a bit of a financial distressed situation where they are now uh, what you could argue is a forced seller, right? So they kind of have to sell. This is not a great time to sell, but this what that means is that this is a great time to buy. So we're really pleased with our basis. We're actually purchasing the property, as you can see in the top left, for just over $76,000 per unit, uh, which is really a, a fantastic basis. I mean, yes, the property needs a little bit of work because of course, nothing is easy. Uh, when you have a distressed seller like this, you know you can imagine that the property is not being managed to its full potential, uh, which you know you can look at bullet point three here. We discuss here how the current owner accumulated a very large portfolio in a short amount of time. And as they were buying all these deals and filling up their portfolio, they're of course not focusing on the, the management of these individual properties. So Aspire is definitely held back from reaching its full potential from a management perspective. Um, but overall, the property is stable and performing. So we're very happy, uh, like I said, with the basis. Yeah. And I, and I want to further that point. This property in the portfolio is actually performing greatly better than the other ones and relative to the other you know deals that uh, the seller is managing. So that's something to note there. On top of that, uh, this deal has done very well historically. Uh, so you know occupancy has been about 93% for the last 20 plus years, which is great. Um, so that's something that we are very excited about is that occupancy here um, in a recessionary environment is uh, looking very solid. Very nice. So- Another thing, actually, you know, we just finished up our our weekly podcast recording, and on that show, we talked about different strategies and what makes the most sense in today's environment. And so, in an environment like today, where uh, we're potentially going to see a recession in 2024, a softening in multifamily fundamentals, you know, we're really cognizant of those factors, and we're also uh, just less willing to push rents aggressively through a business plan and, and do premium renovations because. Uh, there's just less of an opportunity there. So as you can see here, uh, the current rents are about $941, which is a really strong rent number as compared to the basis of 76,000 per unit. But even more interestingly, our pro forma rent is actually $940. So we're basically keeping rents flat. And that's in part due to the fact that we're restricting rents through the affordable housing program. And that's why we're getting the partial property tax exemption. But it's also indicative of the fact that we're buying at a good basis and we're not buying and needing to raise rents to earn our returns, right? We, we find that to be riskier in today's environment. And so 
we're actually focusing more so on deals that have great in-place income and that we can generate a strong return without taking a lot of risk through rent increases, which we think are going to be more challenging to do over the next year or so, uh, given the current economic environment. So we're definitely convinced that today in 2024 is a very strong time to buy, but that doesn't mean that the strategy of a couple of years ago of buying and raising rents, $100, $200 is still in full effect. You know, we're, we're definitely understanding that we're in a different environment today. So with that being said, we still have a uh, pretty strong CapEx budget here, budgeting just about $2.5 in upgrades, as you can see here, uh, for the CapEx budget of a little over 7000 per unit. And that's going to be mainly focused on curing deferred maintenance, as well as doing modest interior upgrades, because there's some classic units, there's some down units that are in unrentable condition. So we're just replacing faulty appliances, worn down flooring, you know, really just getting the property into rent ready condition across the board, which we'll show you some pictures of shortly. And to add a little more context as well, part of the abatement plan requires that each unit does get a little bit of love and equity or money put into the CapEx plan. So that also keeps compliant and is part of the trade-off with, you know, part of the uh, partial tax abatement is to accommodate and have good supply to the local areas. And uh, Elijah Brown, uh, thanks for putting the question in the Q&A. Uh, he asked, who is the seller? Um, you know, it doesn't, we're not harming anything by saying that the seller is, is GVA. So <laughs> if you want to look into what's going on with GVA, you're more than welcome to do so. Uh, but that is the seller here for this deal. And also just to highlight, you know, we're kind of bearing the lead. Uh, I think those of you that know Lone Star well, we're not uh, very aggressive people and we don't like to overpromise. Uh, but you can see that we actually have some very strong returns projected here. 17.8% net IRR projected to investor uh, with a corresponding 2.1x equity multiple over a five-year hold uh, combined with an 8.3% cash on cash. So those are some really strong numbers on their own. But when you factor in the fact that the business plan is very conservative, in my opinion, where we're not projecting to raise rents and push revenue a whole bunch, I, those numbers really, really stand out to me where you're able to pursue really strong, really high returns without taking a ton of risk, right? That's the name of the game. So uh, again, it's in our nature to under promise and over deliver uh, and not the other way around, but that's just how strongly we feel about the numbers uh, that are behind this deal. And we're also going to go a little more in depth and comprehensive in this webinar to display the underwriting where we you know, generate these returns and actually show you the conservative nature and why we actually think we might be able to beat that projection uh, pretty swiftly. So yeah. Cool. So going diving in a little bit deeper into uh, the deal here, like we mentioned on the previous slide, there's 46 units that are classic. Uh, so 289 units have received minor upgrades. But with that being said, we're not doing a comprehensive renovation program here. We're just getting the units up to par, as we like to say. Uh, one of the more exciting things that we are doing in the business plan is we are adding a bulk Wi-Fi package which will, is projected to generate about $35 per unit per month. And I think really importantly to note here is this income that we're going to be uh, increasing, the, the increase in income to the property here is not going to come at the detriment of affordability. What that means is tenants already buy, by and large, Wi-Fi, right? Everybody, who, who do you know that doesn't have internet, right? So... <laughs> They're already getting it from somewhere, but the bulk Wi-Fi program is uh, one where the property buys internet in bulk and then sells it individually to the tenants. And so at a, at a fair price, if not a below market price. And so this is a great way for the property to generate more income because we're able to buy internet in bulk for cheap and then able to capture that spread. So increase the income of the property while not burdening the tenants with additional costs. Right, because we're very sensitive to affordability, and also because this is a nonprofit partnership where we are uh, providing affordable housing, that's also an important component here. Uh, but really, as you can see in the fourth bullet, the biggest driver of returns for this deal, not just for cash flow, but for total returns, is the fact that this property is eligible for a 50% property tax exemption. And so this is possible 
like I mentioned, because we are partnering with a nonprofit uh, to purchase the property, uh, we still are the we still have all delegated managerial control. So it's not like we're introducing a a third party risk. You know, this nonprofit's not going to dictate sale rights or anything like that. Lone Star is still in control of the deal and is still going to be a steward of our investors' capital the same way we are across our portfolio. Uh, but the other uh, the other ways that we are able to qualify for this deal to get this 50% property tax exemption is because the current ownership has owned the property for more than five years. And so that is a requirement of the program. And then also, as Craig mentioned, another requirement of the program is to spend 5000 per unit over the first three years of ownership on uh, renovations. So to make sure that the property is in good shape, which through our inspections, we've uncut we uncovered more than 5,000 per unit in needed repairs and renovations. So we're going to uh, knock that requirement out, no problem. And then also to that point, we actually, after our inspections, we uncovered these issues and we went back to the seller and asked for a further price reduction, which we did receive. So we negotiated a nice price reduction, uh, which now fully reflects our due diligence, our inspections. We've been on site multiple times and uh, we, we have a very good understanding of the property's condition, and we've budgeted accordingly. Craig, why don't you walk through the uh, the debt on this deal? Yeah, so we're doing uh, agency fixed rate debt. Freddie Mac is the uh, provider there uh, with Greystone. Um, as you can see, the LTV is 83.9% and LTC is 76.5% five-year term. Um, so interest rate here is a little interesting. Rob and I actually prior to uh, getting on the horn here with everyone here for this uh, incredible webinar, uh, went through what the math would look like if we were to rate lock today on the five-year treasury. And that debt, although it's at 6%, we want to keep it there to be more conservative, is actually landing closer to just under 5.8%, which will only enhance the cash on cash return, probably a couple basis points over. So that could actually go up to 8.5. We'd rather under promise and over deliver on that front as we've all seen uh, debt go in the other direction in 2023. So uh, we're very happy here that that is going down as opposed to up, which makes us only love the deal even more, which is awesome. Uh, we've got, as I said, a two-year interest only period, uh, a four and a half year yield maintenance on the deal. And then year one ICR is 1.52 or 5.2. And then also stabilized DSCR uh, is 1.41, which is great. We're well over that 1.25 threshold here, uh, which is providing uh, us to have great leverage as well as a cash and cash return uh, and safety, which is awesome. So a couple things here on this debt. So we chose five-year fixed rate debt for a few reasons. Number one, we like five-year loan term because it's long enough to be able to ride out a recession and, and to, you know, to reduce risk. Because anything shorter than five years is kind of more of like a bridge loan profile. And that's not the risk that we're looking to take on this deal. So five years is a good um, middle ground because if we go seven or 10 years, you're now locking yourself in to a longer loan and the prepayment penalty is longer term and more expensive to get out of if we want to be opportunistic and sell the property in let's say three to five years, which that is our desired exit timeline. So the downsides of a five-year loan term is the fact that we'll get that we get less interest only. So as you can see, we're only projected to have two years of interest only payments. And so that reduces our cash on cash. Because if we were, for example, to do a 10-year loan with five years of interest only, then our five-year performer would be all interest only cash flow. And actually, which we'll show in the spreadsheet soon, if we were to actually have five years of IO, the cash flow projected cash on cash would go from 8.3% to 10%. So that's really, really strong uh, cash flows. I mean, 8.3 is really strong on its own, but the fact that it's amortizing for years uh, three to five is, is a very good sign. However, the one big point that I know people are uh, thinking about and are worried about is this LTV, right? They're seeing, oh, this is an 83.9% LTV. That sounds high risk. 76.5% uh, loan to cost. That sounds risky. So the reason why we're comfortable with that level of leverage is because of the tax exemption and the lender is as well. So the way that the lender is underwriting the income of the property is on a post property tax exemption basis. And so 
what we're doing is we're buying the property at about 25.5 million, which in our opinion is the market value of the property prior to any tax exemption. And we think this deal is worth around $31 million after you factor in the tax exemption. So if you actually look at the lo loan to value on a post-tax exemption basis, you're now looking at a $21.4 million loan divided by about a $31 million value, which actually brings the LTV down to about 65%, which is in line with a very conservative LTV level that we're comfortable with. Notwithstanding LTV constraints, the lender is still underwriting to a 1.25 DSCR, which in our humble opinion is a more important risk metric than LTV is. Obviously, you can't live with one and not the other. You have to have both, but we still have a very strong DSCR. And also, I'll finish this off by just mentioning Randy uh, asks in the chat, what is ICR? Uh, ICR just means interest coverage ratio. So it just means your NOI divided by your interest payment, right? Not and the reason why principle. That's yeah, and the reason why that's important is because, of course, we have the two years of interest only on the loan to start. So that's where that sizes up for the first two years, uh, which is very helpful. Uh, not to mention, too, we're getting into Rollonomics here with regards to the cap rate going in with the interest rate. So, you know, he likes Jamie Roll, very, very uh, notable um, passive investor, likes 150 points of spread on his investments. Well, this one is getting uh, very close to it if that is updated to about 150 points plus um, of a spread on on uh, interest rate going in to uh, cap rate, which is awesome. And that's why we feel comfortable with the uh, the debt and the LTV and LTC. Yep. So hopefully that makes sense. And then, Craig, can you please walk us through the uh, projections as well as the structure of the investment? Absolutely. So for your class A investor, which is a minimum uh, 50K, uh, you're looking at a return of about 17.8%, uh, a 2.1x equity multiple, and then a cash on cash return of 8.3%. So cash on cash is different from your preferred return. Um, and for a class A investor, you're going to get an 8% preferred return, a 70-30 split to 15%, and then 50-50 following the 15%. Um, and then for class B, it's a minimum 500K. It's a 19% uh, uh, IRR. Uh, it is a 2.21 X equity multiple. And then still the cash on cash remains the same. And everyone in this deal is pari pursue with regards to uh, the cash flow. Pari pursue means shoulder to shoulder. There's no preferred equity in this deal or any uh, equity that sits above you, above us or anyone there. Everyone will be in receipt of payments equally throughout this deal. Uh, so if you're a class A or a class B investor, it will still be an 8.3% cash on cash return over the whole process. Now that is projected. It could be better. It could be worse. If, you know, occupancy goes down, we don't know where that's going to go, but we feel very confident that it's going to fall roughly in line with that 8.3% uh, threshold. And then that will just show you, depending upon the investment uh, your range you're going to be in, what the class A and B would look like. And then you also want to point out there as well is if you go to the bottom right corner, tentatively what the cash on cash return will be for expectations. So year one, about 6.5%. Uh, and then year two, it obviously spikes up a lot. And then year three, why does it go down? Well, it goes down because of the interest only is burning off at that point. So I think think it's always nice to use, you know, a big round number. If you're invest hundred K, that's what I like to mentally think about. Hey, what's your cash on cash return going to be? Well, take that number. So year one, you know, 6,400 bucks, divide that by 12. That will be your monthly ACH transfer to you uh, on the deal. Perfect. Very good. And that is a good shout out that for those of you that are uh, first time working with us, we do provide monthly updates and monthly distributions uh, at the end of every month, and those begin after the first full month of ownership. So we're jumping ahead here, but we are projecting, uh, hoping to close this deal around February 13. So that means March would be the first full month of ownership. So that means the first distributions would go out uh, at the end of April. Yeah. And just want to mention too, our preferred return is cumulative compounding subject to 100% return of capital prior to us getting into our waterfall splits. So we are investor first here and foremost at Lone Star Capital. It is all about you, the investor, and making sure that your capital is uh, working hard for you and uh, is safe. Awesome. Okay. So let's keep you rolling and let's cover uh, some of the fundamentals of the property here, starting with the interiors. 
Yeah. So as you can tell here, um, nothing too crazy with regards to the interiors, but this is what we're going to have them look like. So these are the updated, you know, they look nice. Uh, it's not overdone. We don't want to spend too much on improvements Well, we're not going to get a reward back for it, but every unit does need to have some love attached to it. As you can tell in the picture to the right, that's roughly what the properties look like. There's 16 individual buildings. As you can tell, no flat roofs here. It's a nice pitch to them. Um, I do believe it's about eight foot ceilings in this property. It is also a 1986 built property as well. I don't know if that was mentioned earlier, but that is the vintage on the deal. Uh, and then as far as, um, you know, the, the property itself, wiring is copper, which is incredible. That is not a cheap uh, factor to fix in the process of owning the deal and as well as plumbing PVC. And that's kind of what you're going to get when you do get, in fact, newer builds, uh, you know, less uh, antiquated building processes for sure. And these have been updated nicely throughout uh, the years. Yeah, and we have a good amount budgeted uh, for HVACs. So like we said before, we've been all up and down this property, fully inspected it. So our scope and budget is robust. And so we're, we're, we believe we are well prepared to handle all of the potential deferred maintenance that uh, is that we're going to address at this property. So uh, that and, and HVACs is a really important one. And that's something that we are well budgeted for. Uh, as you can see, go, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, as you can see, some pictures of the amenities we have here. You've got a nice park and play structure, making it more family friendly. Uh, you've got, you know, the soccer area to the bottom right. You've got a dog park, um, middle right, uh, grilling and outdoor hangout area, uh, middle left, and then of course a nice uh, pool and amenity that the tenants can enjoy uh, at the property there. So as you can tell, uh, the amenities look solid, um, and uh, this is just uh, overall a very nice place to uh, to live if you're a, a tenant and it's well uh, appointed, being very close uh, to many desirable locations locations, which we'll get into uh, as well uh, further on in the, in the project or in the presentation. Yep, for sure. So uh, on the unit mix, we have <clears throat> 84 studios, 162 one bedroom units, uh, 84 two bedroom units, and then five units that are two bedroom, one and a half baths. So I would say this is the one of the bigger downsides of this property is that the unit sizes are a bit on the smaller end. Uh, as you can see, the average square foot is 521. And then we have a, a big portion of the units being uh, studios and one beds. So that I would say is a downside. But like Craig pointed out, this property has been over 93% occupied on average over the last, I believe, 23 or 27 years. So, you know, this has definitely not held back the property before and it will not hold back the property in the future. And considering that we are restricting rents and making this an affordable property, uh, we, we don't have any, we don't anticipate having any issues in keeping this deal full as it has been historically. So jumping into the submarket, uh, like we mentioned, this is in the Balcones Heights submarket, which, oops, sorry, which has experienced a four and a half percent, uh, rent increase in the last 12 months. So rents are still chugging along while kind of across the nation on average rents have slowed, uh, to about no rent increase. So that's the benefit of being in a growth state like Texas, and in particular in a uh, supply-constrained workforce housing pocket like uh, you know where Aspire sits here in San Antonio. And then another compelling data point is the fact that median home sales in the area are 242,000. So that squares very nicely with our 76,000 per unit basis, right? That's definitely got to make you feel good about the multifamily basis as compared to the single family in the area. And then we all know how wide the gap between home ownership and rentership has grown, uh, which is, uh, you know, while unfortunate for the country, is nothing but a boon for multifamily. Yeah, exactly. Especially with, you know, in place, you know, structures like this where they're well below replacement costs naturally. Absolutely. So, yeah. So then I'll let you kind of cover uh, the the submarket here and and the employers in the pocket. Yeah, so very close to the Med Center, which is one of the most key uh, locations to be in if you're going to be in uh, the San Antonio market uh, in that Northwest Corridor. A big partner is actually working on with us for this deal. He'll go nameless. Actually, at our event, uh, we have very nice um, kind of maps of Houston, San Antonio, and in Dallas. And he's like, hey, Craig, here, this area in San Antonio, this is where you want to be. Sure enough, we found a deal in that exact area, of course, to his point. He called me right away and he said, I want to work with you on this deal. Uh, and it's so funny because we were talking about and chuckling how this was exactly where he would want to be if he was going to invest money. And this guy knows everything about Texas. He is 
for sure, a guru and an expert um, in, you know, several Texas markets, of course, San Antonio is one of them. Uh, so he was uh, all over uh, and giddy about this opportunity to partner with us here. So that was very exciting on our end. Uh, but overall, you know, no... Uh, construction or plants coming up in a two mile radius, which is really crucial um, in areas where, you know, Austin, Texas is getting dominated by new supply coming up. Uh, we really want to shelter that, especially with a potential looming recession coming up here. So we feel as if our 3% rent growth will be uh, reasonable to get over the whole period as well. And that won't be hindered by new supply coming up. But generally speaking, very well appointed location, obviously Valero, uh, headquarters nearby, you know, med center near. So all in all in the inner loop, as you mentioned earlier, just a very, very, very solid uh, location, well appointed to everything uh, and in the high growth area. So here we have a couple aerial shots here of Spire and here you can see the proximity uh, to the med center. This doesn't show it quite as good as, as this one here. Here you can see med center uh, just around the way. So yeah, this is definitely where we want to be uh, as far as San Antonio goes. So we're very excited about this acquisition. And then we were also very pleased to find out that we were able to structure this deal with the partial tax exemption component, given the fact that the property has been owned by the current ownership for five plus years. So it really has come together to be a fantastic deal. Uh, so on the rent comps, here we have a couple examples, Latitude being the number one rent comp down the road. Uh, you can see that Latitude has uh, much larger units, so it's not exactly comparable with rents about $50 higher. Um, but you can look at other places like Fredericksburg Place, which is in the other direction, uh, with $1.52 rents with com more comparable unit size. Uh, and, and also, of course, all these properties are similar vintage to Aspire. Uh, being mostly 80s and some 70s vintage properties. And you can see occupancies, for the most part, are strong across the board with an average in the area of about 93% occupancy. And we'll, like Craig mentioned, we're going to pull up the underwriting model in a second here to show you some of the underlying assumptions in our projections so you can get a better sense of where these certain um, metrics are coming in at, these inputs. On the sales comp side, again, you, you know, we're... What we're experiencing right now in the market is a resetting of the basis. So prices have come down substantially, making it a very enticing entry point right now. So as we mentioned, we're under contract at just over 76,000 per unit, which if you look at recent comps, which of course you look at uh, late 2021, late 2021, some in the middle and early of 2022, uh, and even into 2023, these are you know, this was at the top of the market as well as once the market started to shift. But you can see these are much, much higher prices. prices, And so basis was a lot higher. So uh, the high watermark in the market is there. We definitely feel very comfortable uh, with our projected exit, given the fact that we have added value through that property tax exemption, which uh, a future buyer will have the opportunity uh, to place, to keep the property in that program and uh, and continue on enjoying the partial tax exemption. Yeah, and I think the if you want to go back to that real quick, then mm -hmm. the comp I would want to look at most, frankly, um, is that Spice Creek deal, right? It was the most recent trade uh, on the ledger here, uh, 86 built as well. So very, very similar to us. And that traded about 109 a unit uh, about a year ago on the dot and about a year ago when we're closing. So naturally getting something for, you know, 30 grand uh, less is, uh, or 33 grand less than that per door is uh, quite enticing. So of course, when you buy in the cycle is important. And I think where we're getting this deal and, and the nature of uh, the business plan uh, makes me feel very comfortable uh, considering the conservative nature to it. Yeah, great stuff. So we're actually going to jump over to the model real quick. So not to overwhelm anybody, uh, if you haven't seen this spreadsheet before, this is our underwriting model that we use to run the financial analysis for our potential investments. And so we just wanted to pull this up to get into a little bit more of the nuts and bolts uh, behind our financial projections and the business plan. So here you can see some of the similar metrics that we already shared with you as far as purchase price, the acquisition debt, and the, the metrics behind that. Something really important to point out is our going in cap rate is 7.43%. And that is, of course, on a post-partial tax exemption basis. So 
that's showing you how much value the property tax exemption is creating. If we were to buy the property free and clear, or not not free and clear, but just without a tax exemption, the going in cap rate would be around 6.2. Uh, so we're adding about 1.2% in cap rate value through this partial tax exemption. So that's a really attractive, positive, everyone's talking about positive leverage these days. And so the fact that day one, we're going to be operating at a 7.4 7 cap offset by around a 6% interest rate. And as Craig mentioned, today's rate, if we were to lock, would actually be 5.75%. So that's a very healthy, positive leverage spread between our cap rate and our interest rate. And so we just hope that treasuries hold and that we'll be able to lock the rate at lower than what we're projecting here at 6%. I know Craig loves to play with these sensitivities, so I'll go ahead and pop oh, yes. in today's rate at 5.75. And you can see that uh, it pops up the average cash on cash over the hold from 8.3 to 8.8. 8. And, and the yeah. IRR gets a little bit of a boost as well. But of course, you know, we want to have some wiggle room because treasuries could come up prior to us closing. We don't anticipate rate locking until around, you know, a week or less before closing. So that's why we're going to, yeah. yeah, so it's about a month from now. So we're going to still be subject to market fluctuations, uh, but that 6% rate should provide us plenty of cushion here. And then also, Rob, would you wanted to show real quick too, just from a conservative nature? Uh, and Thomas Gaines just asked this. Hello, Thomas, how are you? Um, can uh, would we need to hold the deal for five years for the next buyer to continue the property exact exemption? How does that work? So I would love for you to explain that, Rob, and also maybe to show the underwriting and how this deal perform. If you know, for instance, the next buyer uh, elected to not use the tax payment program. Um, so just maybe show what those scenarios look like, just to show uh, the conservative nature to this deal, actually. In fact, I think that'd be really insightful. Um, I think right now, more than anything else, is answering to downside protection. So if we could kind of display that in this opportunity here uh, on this webinar, I think that'd be very useful. Yeah, that's a great point. Great question. And sensitivity analyses and analyzing downside is always important. And for this deal, it's a little bit unique because one of the downsides theoretically could be the loss of the partial tax exemption. So it's not as straightforward as your typical, you know, exit cap rate, rent growth, stress test or sensitivity, right? We actually have to look at this specific binary risk, if you will. So, so firstly, to answer Thomas's question, if uh, so, the, the way that it works is we can actually sell our entity uh, rather than sell the real estate to the future buyer. And so that gives them flexibility to maintain the program or to uh, re-enter the program in a new... Uh, so for example, I mean, this actually, I, I don't, this is getting a bit too complicated. The simple answer is we can sell the entity and the new buyer can buy our existing entity. And the existing entity, right, has been, um, been already receiving the tax exemption. So it uh, that's how you get around the five years for the next buyer. Uh, for us, because we're the first into the program, we are fortunate because we're purchasing the property from uh, an entity that has owned the property for five years. So we're able to just simply buy the property. We don't have to buy the entity from the current owner. Yeah, and they bought this deal in 2018, which I don't know if that means anything, but just for reference of timestamps, uh, they bought it in 2018. So it's perfect for us to acquire this deal and flip it into uh, this specific tax payment program. Yeah, exactly right. So let's let's so and one, one thing we did is we projected a 6.5% exit cap rate on this deal. And the reason why we did that is to allow for the fact and for the risk of the future buyer not performing the partial tax exemption or not wanting to value the property with that property tax exemption. So we believe the true exit cap rate for this deal should be something closer to 6% you know, maybe six or six and a quarter, but we underwrote six and a half because of the risk of losing the tax exemption. So, uh, you know, one thing we can show here is it, it, it might be a little bit complicated for me to do this because basically what, what happens is the risk of losing, the risk of the tax exemption not being valued hits the sale price, but it doesn't affect our cash flow, right? We're going to be getting the tax exemption every single year, and that's going to be benefiting our cash flow. But then at the sale time, if a future buyer doesn't want to value the property on a post partial tax exemption, then that's going to hurt our sale value, right? So the analysis that we would run then is we would reduce the sale price. 
And that's actually what we did. We took the exit cap from six and a quarter to six and a half. And that's how we arrived at this projection of around 118,000 per unit. So we believe the property in five years without factoring in a tax exemption will be worth around 118,000, which if we flip back to our comps here is exactly in line with the average of the comps of the recent trades of the comp set. So we think that, that that's, that's a defensible and supportable assumption that the property without a tax exemption will be worth 118,000. And if a buyer comes in is and it's aggressive and willing to pay and value the property based on the partial tax exemption, we'll be able to sell actually for more uh, than what we have projected there, which is that hundred and almost 118,000 per unit. So any other, I mean, I guess if there's no other things here to share, I will jump over to the sensitivity analysis. Could you plug into the IRR what full property tax pro taxes would look like for the exit scenario, just to show downside protection to this opportunity um, to maybe ease some worries? Yep, sure. No problem. So the way that I would do that is I would actually take out the partial tax exemption from the property taxes, which is about a $313,000 savings in cash flow. So what I would do here is I would do $313,000 of extra cash flow. Because like I said, that cash flow is still ours. It's just a question of the value upon exit, right? I hope that makes sense for everybody. Yeah. We're, we're so, locked in there. It's just the next person to help them understand it. And for sensitivities, if you want to you know, look at a doomsday scenario, if you will. And even yeah. with that occurring... At a very, you know, conservative exit cap, um, you know, we're still getting very good returns there. Um, you know, just shy of a 15 IRR with an 8% cash on cash return. Obviously, it doesn't change that much, the cash on cash, because we have it. Um, but just to show a downside of, of a range for those who, you know, really care about those things, we are not by any means saying that this uh, abatement is going to go away. It's slightly out of our control. Um, we assume that it'll be in place in the future. But if you want to value it otherwise, here you go. Yeah. And then Shan in the Q&A is asking how many years left for the tax exemption. This is a perpetual tax exemption. Uh, it's an as of right law in Texas that if a nonprofit owns the property and satisfies certain conditions of affordability, uh, you can certify every single year for the tax exemption. So as long as this law is in place, uh, which of course you're taking risk there that the law has changed. Uh, but from our understanding, and we're pretty in the weeds of Texas affordable housing politics, this law is not on the chopping block. So in the in the near term, we don't anticipate this law going away. But of course, that's a risk that we're going to have to live with uh, as far as the continuation of this law and this program where we can get this partial tax exemption. And there is a nice enough moat around this uh, exemption, considering the fact that, A, not every single county in an in, in area in Texas doesn't accommodate this structure, although it's a Texas-wide initiative. For instance, Houston does not. Um, so it's nice if we get this deal here. And then Diane asked a question, under what circumstance might the property lose a partial tax exemption? That's kind of a speculative question. We don't know. That's you know out of our control. We're just going to navigate this deal to the best of our ability. We don't believe it's going to go away, but um, we just want to be transparent with everyone through this process. We feel great about this opportunity and this uh, exemption. Yeah. I mean, like we talked about, like we just mentioned, if the law changes, we would uh, lose this partial tax exemption. If uh, we were unable to maintain the affordability standards, uh, but you know that again is a is a very remote risk, uh, given our team's experience with managing the uh, affordability requirements, the affordable requirements. So yeah, we don't we we see the biggest risk of the tax exemption changing would be uh, just the law being changed. So this is very different for those of you that are, have partnered with us on our other property tax exemption deals. This is very different than those other structures uh, because we're not dealing with our counterparty or our partner in the deal is not a local housing authority. It's a nonprofit. So it's not a governmental entity. It's a nonprofit entity. So we all know uh, the joys of working with the government. All right. It, it's a uh, much more in challenging nature. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's a, it's not as speedy of a process and so the the benefit here is that we're dealing with a, a private nonprofit. Uh, so we don't have to go and get any approvals from the city, from city council, or from a housing authority or from a mayor or anything like that. We're not uh, relying on any sort of legislature. So 
uh, that is the difference here and the benefit of this program, albeit it comes at the cost of it being only a 50% tax exemption rather than being a 100% property tax exemption. Okay, so we appreciate all the questions and we have more time for more questions, so please keep them coming. In the meantime, I'm just going to highlight some of the sensitivity analyses here. Uh, so, you know, Many people like to look at these different scenarios and, and look at the exit cap rate versus the rent growth projection. So, you know, for this deal, we're projecting 3% rent growth with 3% annual expense growth as well. And so you can see that if rent growth is not 3%, but instead 2%, but we exit at the, in our opinion, conservative 6.5% exit cap rate, the IRR is still 15.7. So if you look at the totality or the total range here in this table, we have 12.1% IRR, all the way out to 22.7. Obviously, 22.7 is a fantastic return for investors. And then on the downside, I'll just caveat the fact that if we are in an anemic environment where rent growth has been weak or weaker than projected and exit cap rates or, or cap rates in the market are all the way out to seven and a quarter, you know, there's just not going to be much of an incentive for us to want to sell the property. We would rather hang in there and cash flow at around 8% than sell into a weak market where we're only getting paid a seven and a quarter cap for the deal. So it, given our debt structure and our debt term in the business plan, we don't foresee us becoming four sellers and having to sell and settling for a 12% return. We can wait until the market is stronger at a base case of six and a half percent exit cap or even a 6% exit cap and below and capitalize on mid-teens returns and greater. And then not to go too far in the weeds, but two more stress tests and sensitivities. And then I promise we're, we're done here. Uh, a very popular one is occupancy and, and stressing that. So break-even occupancy here starting in month one. So basically day one break-even occupancy is 76.3%. That's extremely powerful considering the fact that the property has averaged over 93% occupancy over the last 20 plus years. Yeah, we're 18 points higher than that currently. Right. And we do foresee occupancy going down in the near term once we take over because we're going to have to deal with uh, cleaning up the property, retenanting the property, and uh, getting it really up to up to Lone Star condition. Uh, but in the long run, we foresee the stabilized vacancy rate as we have it projected being at 7% vacancy. And then in year one, right, as the income grows, the break-even occupancy goes down. So you can see the break-even occupancy goes down modestly to 74.6% and then into year two at 71.6%. So uh, break-even is very low occupancy, which is obviously great to see as that is a risk mitigant. And then finally, to cover the refinance exit test, this, in my opinion, is a very important exit test because if we're choosing to do a five-year loan, Right, that loan is going to mature in 60 months, and we're going to need to be prepared to ideally sell, ideally sell and make a great return. But if the opportunity to sell is not there, we need to be in the position to refi to be able to hold for more time as we buy time to sell into a stronger environment. And so here you can see if we stress both the operations of the property as well as the valuation of the property, specifically if we reduce NOI by 19%, we increase interest rates to 6.6 .6, and we increase cap rates to 7.15. I mean, this is this is some real stress test. Those are nasty numbers. You can see that we'll, we would still qualify in these very painful conditions. We would still qualify for a $21 million loan and the existing loan in 60 months will be 20.6. So we'll actually be able to qualify for a loan greater than the existing loan. So we'll be able to do a, a small cash out, basically cash neutral refi and avoid a capital call, which is, of course, very important as we look to preserve investor capital. So, of course, refi exit tests can get more complicated than this, but I just wanted to run through that really quickly because I think it's a very powerful metric to kind of get people comfortable with the downside scenario of, these, of this deal. And with that being said, I'm just going to quickly reshare my screen and finish off here and let you all know that uh, firstly, thanks again for sticking with us through this webinar. 
Uh, we went live last week. I know during the holidays, it's a very tough time to launch a new deal, uh, but thank you for bearing with us and thank you for your interest. Uh, today is January 3rd. We're having the webinar. And so our funding deadline is set for February 2. Uh, as you can imagine, we've had very strong interest on this deal. So we highly encourage you to please uh, go on to the investor portal, fill out the subscription, and uh, get your funds in before the deadline as we look towards closing um, on February 13th. Yeah, and, and yeah. I just want to make a couple points clear. I don't know if we mentioned this or not to start, so this might just be redundant, but this is a 506C offering, meaning it's only open for accredited investors. Obviously, uh, if you don't know what that is, uh, you should probably look that up. If you know what that is, you know you can answer if you qualify or not for the accredited status. Um, but so you know, no and no non-accredited investors allowed into this opportunity. Um, and then uh, to mention on top of that too, there is a little bit of space left, but we do truly believe this deal will oversubscribe pretty quickly. So if you are on the fence or are really interested in this deal, reach out to myself and I can let you know where we're at with regards to space. Uh, allowed for this opportunity, um, as we do think this will dry up quickly as it's not a huge raise, just about 9.3 million or $9 million for this one. Um, so let me know if you have any questions regarding this, if you'd like to partner with us, let me know. Um, I think I sent a message, although Rob, I think it only went to us with my calendar link um, and everything there. Is there a way we could send that out to make sure everyone has that if they want to schedule a call with me uh, following this webinar? Yeah, sure. I'll put that in the chat for everybody. Uh, there. And then also for those of you that are listening to this, that are investing through a fund of fund, uh, your fund of fund may or may not be a 506 C. So the parent offering Lone Star's offering here is a 506 C offering. But if you're investing through a fund of fund, that could be a 506 B offering, which would be a credit, uh, which would be open, uh, to sophisticated investors. And, uh, and of course, the difference between a B and a C is that you self self certify your accredited status in a five hundred six B, but in a five hundred six C offering, you're going to have to have your accredited status third party verified. And one of the easiest ways to do that is through a letter from your CPA. Uh, so we have all that automated through our investor portal. So uh, please head over to the investor portal. We've sent out an email with the link to our portal. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll send out an email very shortly after this call uh, with the recording as well as with a link to the investor portal where you can uh, subscribe to the offering and then proceed with the verification process and funding process. Once more, Rob, would you also please throw in my email as well as my phone number uh, too? And then also we skimmed over uh, the... Uh, information regarding our two deals at one full cycle. To learn more about that in our portfolio, go to lscdd.com as well to look through our case studies. If you want to vet us further, uh, you know, look at our testimonials. We're an open book. Uh, we're here to you know answer, make everyone feel as comfortable as possible. Perfect. Beautiful. Well, uh, unfortunately, we didn't make record time, but I think we yeah. covered everything uh, that we were hoping to cover. So Thanks everybody for sticking to the end. And like we mentioned, if you have further questions, just please reach out and we'll uh, we'll get with you individually. So thanks again, happy new year, and we look forward to investing with you.